hey, hey, with, with 2020 being the year it was, the, the discussion of how we can make changes in our lives to go in the direction we want to go is more important than, than ever. So, so it's, it's my pleasure to, to share with you an extraordinary guest today who, who, who made a major change in his life and did it so so gracefully. So um without further ado 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 uh, our goodly awesome podcast starts in three, two, one and a half, one and seven point seven five, whatever. It's starting now. Today's guest Dave Beat. Uh, let me tell you about Dave. D- Dave is the kind of guy who quits his job as a banker to play with dogs all day. As the premier prep photography boutique in, in Southern California, he documents and preserves memories of beloved pets and custom art. Dave has a phenomenal story and just is a a great great friend and and without further ado, um, help me welcome Dave Dave Eat. Hey Dave, well, welcome to our goodly awesome podcast. Thanks, Jason. It's great to be here. Um stunned by the thunderous applause. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Round of applause. Thanks for having me. So, so you're welcome. So let's start early in life. Um, as a kid, did, did you have fun experiences with pets? Yes. Um, I had a dog when I was real little. He was a Welsh Corgi. He was a powder puff, meaning he was, he had a recessive gene and he was soft and cuddly rather than coarse haired like the Welsh Corgis are supposed to be. His name was Sam and uh, we had all kinds of great adventures. He was a lot of fun. Um, Then I had cats and other dogs and guinea pigs, turtles, frogs. One day I brought a raccoon home from the woods. Um, <laughs> what? What? Yeah. That, that doesn't necessarily sound safe. Yeah, that's probably why my parents didn't let me keep it. <laughs> <laughs> I think they called animal control and some people came out and they took this tame baby raccoon that wasn't with its family off. But we had a great time. We had a bo- I remember we had actually a bond and we played together and we... Um, I felt love from the animal, and I, I gave it my love. How, how neat that you could relate to a, a, a baby raccoon you found in the woods. Yeah, it was magical. It was actually one of my earliest memories, and I don't remember how I found it. I just remember bringing it home like it was the normal thing to do. I was really little, probably five or six, maybe seven. We had woods in our backyard that weren't very deep uh maybe maybe a couple hundred yards of woods and and as a kid you're just like uh, this raccoon's all alone it's natural to bring bring it home yeah and it wasn't scared of me it climbed all over me i mean it was it would like sit on my, my my shoulders and climb all over my climb all over me and i would try to hold it but it wanted to sit up here wow so, so how did this um, this young doctor do little? Be, 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 that Dave do little is a Thank little. Thank you. <laughs> so, so how did this this kid who find find so much joy with animals um, segue into becoming a bank a banker? Well, I, um, you know I did what I was supposed to. I went to school and got good grades and went off to college and got a job and worked this job and worked that job. And 
um, got M got an MBA. And after the MBA, I, um, to be honest, I almost moved out of San Diego. I was not having a good time with the job market here. And I went to New York where I was getting more job offers and looked like I would move there. And I came back here to San Diego to settle my affairs and prepare to move out of my apartment. And I went on a job interview and uh, I really liked the president of the bank. He really liked me and the work sounded interesting and I really would have preferred to stay. So I did. Wow. Wow. Well. Yeah. Did, um, um, did you like, did you enjoy banking for a while? Yeah, for a while I did. Um, I was hired to help people both internally and externally learn the online banking system as at the same time I was a salesman. So my job was to go out and bring in new clients. Um, and I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed taking people out. Um, I enjoyed my expense account. Those were sort of before the days where I was concerned with what I was putting into my body and being healthy. And I enjoyed going out to eat um, elaborate meals and drink drinks and that sort of thing. But it didn't, it didn't, it didn't stay with me as, as a great interest for very long. I, I didn't realize that part of your job was literally to wine and dine, wine and dine your clients. Or prospective clients. Hopefully the whining and dining would <laughs> show them <laughs> I was make serious an enough. impression. Yeah, exactly. And it did in some cases and it didn't in other cases. But it wasn't a passionate job for me. So, so at a certain point in your in your career um, as a banker, it, it was clear that 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 you were going to move on from that that job. Why didn't you make a um, just transition to something similar? Like you could have become become a CPA, a, a CFO, or uh, I don't know what other initials to throw at you to show, show that I'm smart, but. Um, well, you don't have to throw initials at me to show me that you're smart. I know you're smart. <laughs> um, I, I suppose I could have, and I might have. Um, the circumstances of my departure from the bank were not super great. Um, I, I had been frustrated with the organization I was working for for about a year. I had, had not been working for about six months. I had been going through the motions of working. And uh, eventually I was just let go. And that was a blessing because I got to think about what else I might want to do. And um, do you want me to tell that story now of how I, how I ended up as a pet photographer? I um, mean, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So do you want the long version or the short version? Um, the medium version? Yeah, yeah, the medium version. Okay, so you you're it. walking out of the bank and you're like, hey, this is my last day. Hmm, what should I do now? Oh, I'll become a pet photographer. Is that That's how exactly it how it happened? Yeah. No. I I left and I had did a lot of reflection actually. Um I spent a lot of time thinking about what I wanted to do and it, it didn't come to me. I, I didn't really know. Um, but I'd always wanted to own my own business. And one day I was sort of sitting on the front stoop and a poodle came down the street without a human. And it was, it was Prospect Street in La Jolla. So it was a busy street. And no, um, no <sighs> leash, no humans. Oh, Prospect, a very busy street. Yep, yep. And I made friends with this dog and it let me put a leash on it. And I read its dog tag and found out where it lived and I took it home. And I was just chatting with the owners who were grateful, but they didn't, they had no idea the dog had escaped. And um, this was a beautiful poodle in a French poodle haircut, you know, with the pom poms. And I just got to chatting with them and they told me that this dog gets its haircut 
uh, once every three weeks to the tune of $175. And I realized, wow, there's a lot of money in dogs. I and, don't even get my hat cut to it, the tune of 175 I don't do spend you? that much. Do you? I don't, no, I do it myself. I don't spend that much money in a year on my hair, in five years on my hair. <laughs> I have a buzzer, you know. Anyway, um, I decided that I would like to own and operate a doggy daycare. And so I got a job working in one. Uh, I worked at PetSmart's Pet Hotel in UTC. And after a couple months, they promoted me to dog trainer and they trained me to be a trainer. And um, I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed it a lot. My plan was to work there for a year to figure out how to do it. And one day I put two and two together and realized that the, the mechanics of dog training, the, the, the gestures and the, the, the AB, um, what's the word, there's a word for the, the binary nature of it, I guess. Uh, I don't know. That's not a great word for it, but the, the, that means stay, right? Like that kind of nature made for good pet. It gave me an ability to do pet portraits. And so I started doing that and people started asking to buy them. And I went from there. I realized, you know, I don't have to rent an expensive place, big piece of commercial real estate. I don't have to have um, people working for me around the clock, monitoring the dogs. I could be a one man show. So slowly it took shape. If any of you have any comments or questions, or, um, want, want to heckle Dave at all, please, please chime in. You're doing a good job of that heckling. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so one day you decided this, and in the next week you made your first ten thousand dollars. Is that that how it works? <laughs> I didn't make ten thousand dollars in my first. You, year you made first twenty thousand dollars the next week. Wow, that's a good week. <laughs> no, I started off at the at at the beach. I didn't even start off at Dog Beach. I went to the beach in Del Mar because they were having a doggy surfing competition. And I, um, I tried to sell to whoever would talk to me, which was about half of the people. Half of the people didn't want to talk to me. They, they were like, now I never heard of a pet photographer. That's not for real. You get, get away. You're trying to scam me or something. Like, okay. Um, but I think my first year in business, I didn't earn $10,000, but I started to see a path to it, to earn more and more. Um, so, so back up slightly, what is a doggy surfing competition like? Um, it, it's a bunch of people with dogs that have trained the dogs to stand on the surfboard. And some of the dogs, I think, actually control the direction that surfboard goes and, and control that. The, the, the run lasts a little longer and a lot of them are just bulldogs that stand still and have low center of gravity and don't fall off. And some of them are more aggressive, like border collies um, that you can pretty much train to do anything you want. And they do more elaborate things. I, I bet uh, seeing a doggy surfing competition is pretty cute. It was a lot of fun. Um, it, it's tough to photograph well at, in, at, in the midday here in Southern California when the sun in is so the high midday, in the sky. Yeah, I bet it's tough. Um, so the light, the light's not beautiful for artistic work, but yeah, I did my best and it was fun. And I, I think I sold one photo that day to the tune of $15 and I, yes. I was super excited. I think that was my first sale. Um, before that, I had just been emailing the photos to people and they weren't paying me. They they would just take the photos and be be happy with them or what happened? Yeah, I wasn't really asking for payment yet. I I didn't know that I had something quite saleable, and I hadn't I hadn't um, laid the the groundwork for a business or or an expectation that they would be paying me, and I didn't I didn't ask. So so in the the first year, you said you didn't make the the money you wanted to, but you. You could see the path. 
Yep. Mm-hmm. So, um, say, say more about that, because because when we start something new, it seems like it's easy to get frustrated when it doesn't yeah. work right away and say, ah. Yeah, definitely. So that first sale was sort of proof of concept, and I just decided I just got to figure out how to make this happen more frequently. Because people liked what I was showing them. Uh, people were happy with the emails that they were receiving with the photos. People loved what they saw in the back of my camera. I just had to figure out a way to monetize it. And so initially, I, I started a, a, um, a speculative photography business where I would go out and do the photography unpaid on speculation of print sales. And um, I got to the point where I could consistently average about $20 an hour um, doing speculative print sales. Um, so, on, so, on so, so what did that, what does that look like? So that I looks mean, like me spending four hours or so at dog beach in OB or Coronado or even one of the dog parks in Balboa park and actively working. I had to collect about 20 names per hour or email addresses. So I would, you know, I would look around, see who could look like they could afford to buy photos, and then figure out which dog they were with, photograph the dog, make at least one good shot that I thought would be saleable, introduce myself, and collect an email address. And then once I had, by this point, I had created an online sales platform. So once I had uploaded the photos to the sales platform, then I would send out an email address to all the people I'd met that day and watch the, as the, the dollar signs rolled in, in the cash register. Were, were people always elated when you just started randomly photographing the dogs? No, <laughs> no, a lot of people got really mad. A lot of people demanded that I delete the photo immediately. Some people were super happy. I would say only maybe 2% of people were upset. Um, a lot of, but probably 50% just didn't care less than I could tell. And so over time, I figured out that I could spend less time with those people and spend a little more time with the people who really were excited. And I also figured out that I didn't want to spend too much time with the people that were excited. I wanted them to leave them wanting a little bit more. Mm. Say, say, a, say a little more about it because about that because when we um when we have something to offer and someone mm -hmm. loves that well part of us I'm speaking for me part of me is just tempted to keep giving and giving and giving well that certainly feels good but it doesn't pay the rent <laughs> so how do you judge how much to give a give a prospect to to give them enough so they want something more. Before I've made a sale to somebody, I didn't want to give them more than two or three minutes of my time. I wanted to you know, make the photo, walk over, introduce myself, collect the email address, hand out a business card if they wanted it, and then move on to the next one because the way I was working, it was a numbers game I had to meet. I, had to, I was always targeting 20 people per hour and usually I, was able to get around there. Sometimes I got a few more, sometimes I didn't get there, depended on how busy the, the venue was that day. And if, if the venue allowed me to do that. Because if you weren't aware of this, I suppose you could talk to one person for half an hour about, about the dog that they, they mm -hmm. love so, so And much. I did in the beginning. I, I realized people love to talk about their pets. And why wouldn't they? I mean, they're like, basically, they're, they're children. They're, they're, they're surrogate children in the event that people don't have children. So, of course, they love to talk about them. But... I didn't want to hear more than a couple of minutes just because I had to move. I felt like in those days I had to move on and meet the next one. It's not that I wasn't interested. It's that I was working and had something specific in mind I needed to accomplish. So, so how do you, um, how do you politely move on before the person broke into the half, half hour long story about Fufu? 
I just explained nicely that, hey, I'm, I'm here trying to meet as many people as I can in this time. And um, I'm super happy that they were willing to meet me and friendly and thanked them for their time and for their email address. And I told them that I would email them. And that if I was going to photograph their pets, then I would need to know that more, that additional information about the pet. Oh, That's private oh. session stuff. Oh, so at that point, you were more, you weren't just trying to sell the few photos you took of them, but, but I wasn't. to upsell them to a private session. Yeah, it was about the sell, upsell to the private session. Yeah, I wanted to sell those photos that I did be, at, at the dog park. But I, I, you know, it's hard because some some people would buy them, and I didn't want to discourage them from buying. But I also, wa yeah, I wanted to sell the private session, and so it, it was a walking a fine line, I guess, between spending too much time chit chatting and and actually doing the work that I was there to do. I think a lot of people that I served that way didn't buy a private session because they were satisfied. And I think that's why I averaged $20 an hour doing it. Yeah, sometimes I had much bigger sales, like a couple of people bought a couple hundred dollars worth of imagery, um, you know, printed and mounted like the things you see behind me. But most people just wanted a digital file and they bought it off the website and then they never, I never heard from them again. So, so, so th th this approach was a, an a innovation from from when 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 you start you started when well, you yeah. were just sending photos that, out. That's true. When I first started, I was just emailing, and then I got my first website, and my first website was incredibly difficult to administrate on my end. It took a lot of time on my end, and. I eventually upgraded that to a sales platform called SmugMug, which I still use today. And SmugMug basically create allows me to upload a folder full of images, create a gallery, invite people to it. And then when the people are in there looking at the gallery, they can find their dog if it's one of many and purchase it. And then they decide they per wanna purchase it. They get um, a list they can do like prints, they can do wall art, they can do um, digital downloads. Um, there's a lot of a lot of options among those three categories too. Like, you know, you can do four by six print, you can do a five by seven print, eight by 10, 11 by 14, big, all the way big up to like 24 by 36, I think is the largest wow. size I sell there, which is poster size, which is what you see behind me of the, sorry, these, it's hard to do it in reverse. These um, these guys right here, these these two Vishlas, um, that's a twenty four by thirty six print way way behind me on the wall. There it is. So 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 the dog in the water. There's two actually. Yeah, you want me to bring you over and see it a little closer? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Sure. So this will be interesting. Um, th this is my office in my showroom, my clients, uh, right there, there it is. So this is 24 by 36 inches long. Wow. Wow. So, so, so that photo is not just about the picture of two dogs with a, with a white background. You're really using the environment. That totally. To that's the environment, but I can do a, a dog on a white background too. It's kind of it's kind of tricky photography, and it's really the reason I have a job is black dogs and white dogs are especially hard to photograph. So to get a a white dog looking white on a white backdrop, you know, without studio lights, your dog is going to end up looking um, dingy or dark. Um, but in this one, the light in here is not great because it's. The only lighting source is the, the door on the other side of the room back. That's the light source. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so you can see the rest of the room if I stand in the middle and pivot a little bit. So this is, that's the front door or that leads to the front door of the house. 
the seating area and my desk. It's a big seating area. Outdoors wow. to my, my garden. And then I have a bar here. And that's the door to my the kitchen. And then we're back here. Wow. Can I sit down again? Um, you, you, you can, you can, please. Okay. Okay. So, so then, then you were, um, you were figured out how to go from making 15 bucks at, at a s event to, to making 20, 20 bucks an hour. What, what was the next innovation after that? Um, the next innovation, probably email marketing. I, I collected a lot, I collected thousands of email addresses and I still market to them um, for private session work. Another in innovation was starting to go to dog shows and getting to know some dog breeders and some of them were incredibly helpful to me in promoting me in attending dog shows um, in an official photographer capacity. So when a dog is awarded a ribbon, uh, usually a photo is taken um, and the show hires a couple of exclusive official photographers and only the official photographers are allowed to walk into the ring and carry a sign box which has um the sign box is full of placards that say the name of the show they have my copyright on them and then they say the name of the accolade that that the dog won if it was like you know um winner's dog or uh, best in show or whatever whatever it was that the the pet had won or the animal had won well, and then i well, sold those sorry i sold those through the same speculative system, but this time I had collected email addresses of people who needed the photos rather than people who might want the photos. So, so like I assume most people want a want a professional photo of the the dog winning a, an award at a dog show. Yeah, so so these photos are staged. Actually, the judge waits and poses. Um, with the dog and the handler and maybe an owner, if the owner is present, maybe even the owner's friend is present and they stand and pose. And it's a very high tension environment because it's, it's work for these people that they, they show dogs on a daily or a weekend basis every weekend. And they're there and they want to get the photo made as quickly as possible and move on. And the dog has to be perfect. The people have to be looking at the, at the dog or the, or at the camera. Um, the moon and the sun and the stars have to align while I'm ready and in position to take the photo. And the dog has to be looking at the correct angle. Um, some dogs, you want to photograph a, a dead profile, so like 90 degrees to the camera. Other dogs at a 7 eighth angle. Some, some people want their dog looking right into the camera. And how many minutes do you have to figure this out? I, I have about two minutes to, per dog. Two minutes for, to, about. To, to pose a dog and their people and get a picture, two minutes. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's always done the same way. So the judge knows where to stand. Uh, the handler knows where to stand, unless it's a brand new person, in which case I, I just patiently tell them what to do. and. And they're responsible for stacking the dog, which means placing all four feet of the dog where they want them relative to the camera to, to evidence that the dog is built correctly. Wow. It's, it's, um, it's interesting for sure. I'm doing a dog show this weekend. It's a hound show up in um, uh, near Anaheim at the Oak Canyon lake oak no oak 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 canyon park there's irvine lake and uh it'll be all hound breeds so rhodesian ridgebacks and dachshunds and oh. afghan hounds and whippets basset hounds should be fun well, 
Well, ha have you ever done that show before? Nope, it's my first time. I was, I was. It's also the biggest show I've ever done. I was scheduled to do it last year, but then COVID happened, and um, everything got pushed back a year. So I understand yeah. it's a little, little different this year. I understand that instead of a spend all day at the dog show kind of thing, it they they sort of expect people to show and go after you're done showing the dog go home if you didn't win it's sort of a it's a process of elimination bracket competition it's only uh, only yeah. one dog gets the best in show and so if you have uh, if you're done you go home i guess so I don't, we'll see how it's like I, I don't know it'll be my first it's my first dog show since september or since february of last year it's been a long time wow wow that that's exciting yeah so, 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 if you're talking to someone at, at, at the dog show on, on their break, and uh, I mean, on, on your break, and they they say, "Hey, Dave, I have this idea for the, this new new business," but um, but I I I don't know. I should probably just stay stay in my job. Um, it, 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 I I could fail at the new business. What what would you tell them to? Uh, I think any, them? I don't I don't think anybody that works with dogs all day is going to say that because dogs make you so happy that like how could you not want to work with dogs all day? Oh, but maybe there's a banker at the dog show just as a spectator, and I'm chatting with them. I would say do it, do it, go for it. No, it, it's um, it's a challenge. You know, you, you have to have all your ducks in a row. Um, it was scary for sure. Um, but I, I think I think I was on a path, and um, you know, I, I had a, I'd been working for years. I had a big bank account. I had a a wonderful supportive family. I was, I could fail. I was able to fail if if I failed. Um, I wasn't. I wasn't supporting children. I w didn't have a wife. I di didn't have a mortgage. It was really quite easy to um, to go after. It was a no-brainer for me because I wasn't really happy in the work I was doing. I it was okay. But I really enjoy spending a couple hours with a dog and then making the owner just so happy at the end of the day. So, so um, what, what do you do if a dog has a um, kind of an antsy personality or an aggressive personality? How do you? <laughs> I get bit. <laughs> uh, I've been bit in session. Um, and fortunately, the owner um, was, they were pretty cool. They bought me a new pair of pants. Um, it was um, it was a tooth in the butt. It wasn't super pleasant, but you know it happened. If the dog is are antsy, you know one thing I do before a session is I said I ask the owner about the dog and their level of activity and energy, and their usual exercise routine, and I will make a few suggestions about exercising as well as feeding the dog before the session to ensure that I have a a docile and cooperative pet to work with um, rather than a bundle of nerves. I will often, I will often suggest people get the dog extra exercise earlier in that day or even feed the dog less than usual that morning so that the dog is responsive to my treats and stays connected to me and my camera while I'm working. So, so you don't want a highly caffeinated dog who who's <laughs> caffeine is poison for dogs <laughs> like dogs can't metabolize it so like actually it's sad but dogs can die from drinking coffee or eating chocolate um so, so that's probably a bad example well no but you're but you but you make you bring up a good point in that sometimes people's dogs are cooped up all day and then you take them out to the park where they're used to getting their exercise out um and they go crazy and, and they start running all over the place and that's to be expected. That's what they do every day. And so 
if the owner wants fo- wants action photos, that's great because I can play with that dog. I can I can throw the ball real far, and then when the dog is retrieving it and bringing the ball back to me, I can photograph the dog in action, like these vich- these uh, vichlas behind me in the large print. So awkward yeah. looking at myself in the mirror. <laughs> that one there <laughs> there um so I, like i can set that shot up all day long with a dog that likes to play fetch um but if if they wanted the dog sitting and staying then i would suggest exhausting the dog before the session or a very high level of dog training and obedience training and some dogs have that makes my job easy So, um, what, what do, do, does like an owner and a dog ever have a, a unusual interaction where, where the owner excites the, the dog constantly? Sure, sure. And sometimes like if, for example, the owner and the dog often have a codependent relationship um, where they are each other's everything. And that's fine. I, I, mean, I had that relationship with my dogs in high school. Um, but it makes it hard for me to do certain things. For example, to capture a dog in a beautiful sit and stay like like this um, this guy here, this, um, this Boston Terrier. Um, uh, where's my finger? Th- this one. This one. There. <laughs> To get the dog to sit and stay um, requires the dog's focus to be on me rather than the owner. So I will, on occasion, ask the owner to turn around and break eye contact with the dog. And when the dog walks around to make eye contact, that the owner continue breaking eye contact with the dog and continue turning around. And then I'll offer a dog a treat and become more interesting um, for the time I need in order to do what the owner wants me to do with the dog. (laughs) so it's fun it's funny because like i'll I'll, i have to check myself sometimes because here i am working hard for somebody who is actually doing something that's counterproductive to what they've hired me to do (laughs) but it's what they usually do it's it's what they always do and it's their normal way of being which is fine and and so i've had it's been interesting for me learning how to um learning learning ways to 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 ask people to to be more cooperative with me so 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 that that's kind of an awkward position because totally awkward because they your cu- customer the dog's not going to pay you nope the dog's not going to pay me and the dog doesn't care whether i satisfy the customer or not <laughs> And so, uh, you, you know, I, usually I can get the dog's attention with with either treats or play or affection. Do, usually, do, I can off, offer those things in small doses, and to make myself really interesting to the pet. Are, are there any dogs who just don't care about treats? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, really? Some some dogs are not food motivated. Wow, mm-hmm. I I didn't know that. Yeah, they're. I mean, the, yeah, the, some dogs just don't have the appetite. Um, a lot of dogs are ravenous because they're bored and sort of like I use food to to ease my boredom. So <laughs> the dogs do it too. <laughs> it can happen. Uh, some dogs are really focused on affection and they want to be they want to be pet and they want to hear the words "good dog." And some are um, just want to play. They just throw the ball. Just throw it. Don't talk to me now. Just throw the ball. Just throw <laughs> it. Throw it. Throw the ball. And and they 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 like stare at you like like kind of in a creepy way until you throw the ball. <laughs> even if you even if you've obviously taken your attention off of the ball and off of throwing the ball and are having a conversation <laughs> with their owner, they're still staring at you. Like, throw the ball, dude. Throw the ball. Just it's kind of weird, but so, it, yeah, it's normal. 
So, so if you try to communicate with a play dog via tweets or a treat dog via play, you might kind of miss the boat. I might. Yeah, and it's happened. I mean, I, I have to figure out what the dog wants in, in the first few minutes of the session. And, you know, I dedicate the first up to 30 minutes of the session. I'm, I'm expecting to not be taking pictures. I'm expecting to getting be getting to know the dog, developing a working relationship with the dog and teaching the dog that my camera um, is a friend and that when the camera goes click, it means treat much like clicker training. If they've ever done that, they catch on pretty quick. Um, but if they haven't and they're not used to being photographed, then, you know, the big lens is kind of like the eye of Sauron <laughs> staring at you from the top of Mount Doom. It's the, they perceive a stare um, as, an, as, a, as a challenge. And so I, I have to be careful to make sure that the dog perceives the camera as part of the play. Oh well, so so if a dog's really frightened, really scared of the lens, what do you do? Um, I will sit next to the owner, like a little more comfortable, a little more close than is totally comfortable. But I explain this to my client, um, and that the owner's acceptance of me in that space shows the dog that I'm acceptable, and then inevitably the dog becomes curious, wants to smell me. And then I offer the camera to smell the camera. Um, my camera smells really good because I work with treats and I use these hands to operate the camera and to dispense the treats. So my camera smells good to dogs. A treat smells smelling camera. Yeah, I usually use sliced hot dogs. So my camera smells like hot dogs. Oh, oh yeah, you, 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 don't, you don't do the milk, milk bone thing. Or I don't, like I that. don't. As a, as a trainer and as a photographer, I don't like hard treats because the dogs crunch them up and make crumbs. And then <laughs> the dogs get distracted by the crumbs on the floor. And I can't photograph the dog when it's trying to eat the crumbs off the floor. So it, it, wastes, it wastes time to feed a milk bone. They're also not real healthy. <laughs> And like hot, not, like but, hot dogs are hot dogs are not mm -hmm. You're right, but hot dogs are high value and they don't make crumbs. And uh, I, most dogs aren't photographed on a daily basis, so hot dogs are good. And I always ask before I before I use hot dogs. And some people say no; they have their own treats that they want me to use. And so I just bring my empty treat pouch, and the owner fills it. Um, uh, I worked with vegan dogs. I had to use sliced carrots. Vegan dogs. Yep. Gosh, I hope I don't get reincarnated as a vegan <laughs> dog. <laughs> Me too. But Jason, you're a good man. You're gonna be reincarnated like as something amazing. Oh good. Thank you. So yeah. so um So how does Imperfect Best tie into all, all this? Like, um, I take it not everything goes perfectly every day in your business? No, it doesn't. Um, it, in, in initially, it, it was awkward, you know, when I would go to Dog Beach and I was just trying to figure it out. I didn't know what, um, I didn't know what to do to get myself customers and to get business and I had to sort of figure it out sort of you know catch as catch can and on a on a trial and error basis and I made a lot of errors <laughs> um, uh, I, I got awkward with people sometimes and you know I would introduce myself and they would be like no I don't want photos go away and then you know, at first I'd be like oh but it looks really cool check it out look at the back of my camera they're like go away dude we don't want to know you <laughs> Like, okay. <laughs> um, I might have even pushed back at that point. Not not hard, but like, are you sure? You know, there's no charge. Uh, only if you pay me if you like it and you want to buy it. <laughs> and that, no, that that's was pretty not awkward. Exactly what they want at the, that that right. moment. <laughs> I don't know if it was awesome, but it was definitely awkward. They're awesome memories, I suppose. Um, yeah, just figuring things out um, was was in the beginning was super awkward. Um, 
I got a, I had a, a super awkward event once I was, I was doing, um, the speculative photography at the dog beach in Del Mar and somebody, and I had a big, long white lens. The, the lens was, the lens was 14 inches long. And when yeah, you extended the one. zoom, it was 20 inches long. It was white. It's what the sports photographers use. And somebody complained to the lifeguard that I was photographing children with my big long lens. And the lifeguard called the park ranger who showed up with two police officers. And they actually detained me and confiscated the camera. And um, they were looking through the camera at the photos. And the one guy said to the other guy, it's all photos of dogs. There's not one child. And it's interesting, the other the other officer said to said to the other one said well what are we going to get him on and i said why do you got to get me on something i didn't do anything wrong but because the police had been dispatched and taken time they i guess wanted to justify that and i was i was written a citation for commercial use of public property and i um it was a charge of solicitation and I thought I was going to have to go and fight that in Vista Court. And um, they sent me the citation in the mail. And then they never sent me a, um, a, a court date. So I called, I called the courts to find out what the date was. And they're like, well, th we don't have paperwork submitted for that. So you are off the hook, sir. But that, that's an awkward story with a ha was, happy pretty, ending. Yeah, and it made me late to the ZZ Top concert at the Del Mar Fair that day. Oh, dude. I was mad. Wow. I got there, but it was a great show. Uh, awesome, awesome. So, um, oh, um, how, how about we, when you went to Asia places? At times, yeah. did, did, did that not work and you stay with the low prices? No. I, some, some, I had, I've been fortunate. I've had some really great mentors, and one of them said, you need to raise your prices and start operating like a professional photographer because your work is, is of that caliber. And I said, okay. But if I do that, don't you think I'll lose a lot of business? And they said, no. And I didn't believe them, and I did it anyway. And I got more business as a result of it. Uh, and I was still doing the speculative thing at those at, at that time. And, and um, I, I, my, my rate went up. And that's what helped get me to the $20 an hour <laughs> level. <laughs> how, how do you explain getting more business when you raise your way? I think people take, it, take you more seriously. They think, well, he spent, he spent, 30 minutes and he's asking for $15. So he's an amateur. But I think that they started to, to perceive more value just in the higher rate, rate, uh, rate that I was charging for what I was offering. They started to see the, see the value in it. So when you were charging 50 cents a minute, they, that, that wasn't really, really impressive to people? I, I don't know why. <laughs> No. So, so um, people people are considering all kinds of changes. Not now, like changing. Um, I mean, some jobs have gone away, so changing career, or I don't know, changing living situation. The list goes on and on. What what would you tell someone like wanting to make a change, but they keep stepping back from it at the the same time because the because they don't know what the unknown w will bring. Well, um, we never know what the unknown will bring, even if we think we know what the future holds. Even if your name's David, you don't know what the unknown brings? I Yeah, I'm not, I'm not special. I, I don't know what's unknown. I don't know if like a big gust of wind is going to come in in a minute and close my laptop while I'm chatting with you. And 
That Could would happen. be amazing if that <laughs> happened. That would be terrible because my when my laptop closes, it ten, it it starts its power off cycle. So we'd be disconnected until I could re relocate that. <laughs> Better put something there to prevent that from happening. Cool. Um. So yeah, let's not have that happen. So um. Don't worry. Uh, so. So, so, so we never know what the future will bring. None of us do. What else? No, we don't. We can predict it. We can do our best to predict it. And, you know, with a good business plan, um, you can sort of take a look at what those unknowns might be and, and you know, best position yourself to deal with them. Um, but inevitably in any business they're like, who thought of that we were going to have a pandemic this year? There's things that come up that you didn't plan for and didn't expect. And you have to remain agile and able to adjust your business for something that comes up, you know, dog shows stopped last year and I had to do what I could. Unemployment was great. <laughs> no, it was miserable, actually. It wasn't, wasn't super fun, but things are opening up again, so that's exciting. Business has picked up. Um, sp 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 that, that's so good. Sp speaking of agility, as we um, go into new situations, I love the story you tell about about the the cat who who was on it on its last leg can yeah. you tell that story as we wrap? sure yeah uh, i was hired to photograph a cat and the cat had some serious um mental not mental um uh, medical issues and um they were terminal and the cat was scheduled for euthanasia um a few days later and um, the client called me and asked me if I could come out the next day. And so I made the time and I arrived at her home and the cat was seated in the cat tree um, in front of some beautiful white gauzy curtains and the light was coming in and it was beautiful, but the cat was drugged up and the cat had recently uh, had her paws shaved and she was really quite catatonic if you'll pardon the <laughs> sorry um and i could you know i made all the noises i could get i could i used the cat teaser the toy I, I tried treats but i just couldn't get the cat to perk up and look like anything that the owner would like in a photograph the cat was just <laughs> like that so, so did you say to the owner, sorry, sorry your, your cat, cat's on its last leg, I can't do anything here? Who's telling the story? Oh, no, that's not what I told him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I asked the owner, um, this was an indoor cat, and I said, since, you know, I, um, since she's scheduled for euthanasia and, and um, she's in a pretty bad way, and I'm not going to be able to get good photos for you and i knew she wanted i knew she wanted photos she didn't want me to give her a refund and go home um i asked if it would be okay if we took the cat outside and she said yes thankfully because we took the cat outside into a little courtyard and, and the cat walked out and it was exciting and stimulating and she perked up and i was able to get some good shots and she just sort of plopped down in the sun happy to be outside and um, then we took her downstairs to a grassy courtyard and um, she played a little bit. She scratched her nails against a tree and, and then there was a hedge and the cat went behind the edge and we're like, oh geez, so she's gonna, she's out. She's no longer somewhere we can catch her and pick her up. So I went behind the hedge in the direction she was walking and I lay down on my belly and I was able to photograph a tiger stalking through what looked like a forest. I was able to make the, the, the hedge look like more than a hedge because um, there was something that smelled good back there. And this poor little cat really perked up in order to 
explore her environment and um she was having a great time and i i got to photograph a little tiger back there and the owner was delighted with what i did so so by um by stepping out and proposing a change a change you not only got, got wonderful photographs but during the last days of this cat's life you you created something beautiful for the cat and, yeah and the, the cat had owner. an amazing time the owner had an amazing time seeing it the owner um the owner was thrilled to tears and mm. um now i keep kleenex within reach of where my clients sit here in the showroom just in case do you do you charge extra for the kleenex or no, I don't charge extra for the Kleenex, but I can't guarantee the the tears. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. So, so as we wrap up, any final words of encouragement for for people? People that want to step outside and, and and do the new thing, yeah, do the new thing. I, you know, when I started eleven years ago, pet photography really wasn't a thing. It was people who were doing it and. William Wegman certainly existed long before that, but there was no pet photographer's handbook. And there are now. Um, and I've even gotten to the point where uh, I'm invited to teach pet photography from time to time. I teach through the local camera shops and I teach every summer at the San Diego County Fair. Wow. Um, yeah, but what the, the thing I did was I looked at similar industries and looked at how they're doing business and looked at what I could adopt and what would be useful for me. So I looked at the wedding and portrait photography industries because and they you existed. even invested in going to a, a conference, right? That's right. I went to, um, it's called WPPI, which is wedding and portrait photographers international or Inc or something. It's a big, big photo conference annually in Las Vegas. And I spent, all day, three or four days in classes, just learning how to do the things that wedding and portrait photographers do with an eye for adopting them for my own uses and figuring out how and what I would use for pet photography. And today I'm doing um, more general portraiture as well. And so I, I use what I've learned in photographing people as well. Well, wow, it, it, it's just just so so inspiring that you you've been on the this journey and Thanks. and and you at a certain point you knew that you wanted to make a change and and you made it instead of thinking throws down the road. Don, I wanted to make a change, but oh, I never did. I'm grateful that I that I did that I was able to, and that it worked out well. Cool. Well, well, thanks so much for being on Awkwardly Awesome Podcast. It's been my pleasure. Is that it? Are we, are we all done? I don't get to ask any questions. Oh, do, do you have any questions, Dave? Yeah, man. I mean, when are you coming so for a visit? <laughs> um. I I I I hope soon because a lot of people here would love to see you. Oh, I I would I would love to see all of you and be in San Diego and and get my stuff. Yeah. Cool. Good. Thank. Yeah. Th thank you. Thanks so much for your time. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. It's just so fascinating. Um, I mean, when when we meet meet people and just talk casually, we don't always get get to hear the amazing stories that that people have of of do, doing the imperfect best, persevering and and really succeeding. And so. I hope you enjoyed that that interview. I sure did. We'll be back um tom tomorrow actually for a special bonus interview with laughter with Dan Dan Johnson. Please tune in. Okay, here's the outro.